Chapter Twenty Five: The Little Countess. Cheerful as my godmother naturally was, and entertaining as, for our sakes, she made a point of being, there was no true enjoyment that evening at La Terrasse till, through the wild howl of the winter night, were heard the signal sounds of arrival. How often, while women and girls sit warm at snug firesides, their hearts and imaginations are doomed to divorce from the comfort surrounding their persons. Forced out by night to wander through dark ways, to dare stress of weather, to contend with the snow blast, to wait at lonely gates and stiles in wildest storms, watching and listening to see and hear the father, the son, the husband coming home. Father and son came at last to the chateau, for the Count de Bassompierre that night accompanied Doctor Breton. I know not which of our trio heard the horses first. The asperity, the violence of the weather, warranted our running down into the hall to meet and greet the two riders as they came in, but they warned us to keep our distance. Both were white, two mountains of snow, and indeed Mrs. Breton, seeing their condition, ordered them instantly to the kitchen, prohibiting them at their peril from setting foot on her carpeted staircase till they had severally put off that mask of old Christmas they now affected. Into the kitchen, however, we could not help following them. It was a large old Dutch kitchen, picturesque and pleasant. The little white countess danced in a circle about her equally white sire, clapping her hands and crying. Papa, papa, you look like an enormous polar bear. The bear shook himself, and the little sprite fled far from the frozen shower. Back she came, however, laughing and eager to aid in removing the arctic disguise. The count, at last issuing from his dread knot, threatened to overwhelm her with it as with an avalanche. Come then, said she, bending to invite the fall, and when it was playfully advanced above her head. Bounding out of reach like some little chamois, her movements had the supple softness, the velvet grace of a kitten. Her laugh was clearer than the ring of silver and crystal. As she took her sire's cold hands and rubbed them, and stood on tiptoe to reach his lips for a kiss, there seemed to shine round her a halo of loving delight. The grave and reverend Signor looked down on her as men do look on what is the apple of their eye. Mrs. Breton said, "He, what am I to do with this daughter, our daughterling of mine? She neither grows in wisdom nor in stature. Don't you find you pretty nearly as much the child as she was ten years ago?" She cannot be more the child than this great boy of mine," said Mrs. Breton, who was in conflict with her son about some change of dress she deemed advisable, and which he resisted. He stood leaning against the Dutch dresser. Laughing and keeping her at arm's length. Come, mamma," said he. By way of compromise and to secure for us inward as well as outward warm, let us have a Christmas vassail cup and toast Old England here on the hearth. So while the count stood by the fire and Paulina Mary still danced to and fro, happy in the liberty of the wide hall-like kitchen, Mrs. Breton herself instructed Martha to spice and heat the vassail bowl, and pouring the draught into a Breton flagon, it was served round. Reaming hot by means of a small silver vessel, which I recognized as Graham's christening cup. Here's to old Lang Syne," said the count, holding the glancing cup on high. Then, looking at Mrs. Breton, "We twa hae peddled in the barn fra morning sin till dine, but sees it win us braid her ords and old Lang Syne." And surely you'll be your pine stoup, and surely I'll be mine, and I'll taste a cup of kindness yet for old lang syne. Scotch, Scotch! cried Paulina. Papa is talking Scotch, and Scotch he is partly. We are home in De Bossom Pierre, Caledonian and Gallic. And is that a Scotch reel you're dancing, you Highland fairy? Asked her father, Mrs. Breton. There will be a green ring growing up in the middle of your kitchen shortly. I would not answer for her being quite canny. She is a strange little mortal. Tell Lucy to dance with me, Papa. There is Lucy Snow. 
Mr. Home. There was still quite as much about him of plain Mr. Home as of proud Count de Bassompierre. Held his hand out to me, saying kindly, "He remembered me well, and even had his own memory been less trustworthy, my name was so often on his daughter's lips, and he had listened to so many long tales about me, I should seem like an old acquaintance." Every one now had tasted the wassail cup except Paulina, whose pas de fille eut de fantasie. Nobody thought of interrupting to offer so profanatory a draught, but she was not to be overlooked nor balked of her mortal privileges. Let me taste," said she to Graham as he was putting the cup on the shelf of the dresser, out of her reach. Mrs. Breton and Mr. Home were now engaged in conversation. Doctor John had not been unobservant of the fairy's darts; he had watched it and he had liked it. To say nothing of the softness and beauty of the movements, eminently graceful to his grace-loving eye, that ease in his mother's house charmed him, for it set him at ease. Again, she seemed a child for him, again almost his playmate. I wondered how he would speak to her. I had not yet seen him address her. His first words proved that the old days of little Polly had been recalled to his mind by this evening's childlike light-heartedness. Your ladyship wishes for the tankard. I think I said so. I think I intimated as much. Couldn't consent to a step of the kind on any account. Sorry for it, but couldn't do it. Why? I'm quite well now. It can't break my collarbone again or dislocate my shoulder. Is it wine? No, nor dew. I don't want dew. I don't like dew, but what is it? Ale strong, ale old October brewed perhaps when I was born. It must be curious. Is it good? Excessively good. And he took it down, administered to himself a second dose of this mighty elixir, expressed in his mischievous eyes extreme contentment with the same, and solemnly replaced the cup on the shelf. I should like a little," said Paulina, looking up. I never had any old October. Is it sweet? Perilously sweet," said Graham. She continued to look up exactly with the countenance of a child that longs for some prohibited dainty. At last, the doctor relented, took it down, and indulged himself in the gratification of letting her taste from his hand. His eyes, always expressive in the revelation of pleasurable feelings, luminously and smilingly avowed that it was a gratification. And he prolonged it by so regulating the position of the cup that only a drop at a time could reach the rosy, sipping lips by which its brim was courted. A little more, a little more," said she, petulantly touching his hand with the forefinger, to make him incline the cup more generously and yieldingly. It smells of spice and sugar, but I can't taste it. Your wrist is so stiff, and you are so stingy. He indulged her, whispering, however, with gravity. Don't tell my mother or Lucy; they wouldn't approve. Nor do I," said she, passing into another tone and manner as soon as she had fairly essayed the beverage, just as if it had acted upon her like some disenchanting draught, and doing the work of a wizard. I find it anything but sweet. It is bitter and hot, and takes away my breath. Your old October was only desirable while forbidden. Thank you. No more. And with a slight bend. Careless but as graceful as her dance, she glided from him and rejoined her father. I think she had spoken truth. The child of seven was in the girl of seventeen. Graham looked after her, a little baffled, a little puzzled. His eye was on her a good deal during the rest of the evening, but she did not seem to notice him. As we ascended to the drawing room for tea, she took her father's arm. Her natural place seemed to be at his side. Her eyes and her ears were dedicated to him. He and Mrs. Breton were the chief talkers of our little party, and Paulina was their best listener, attending closely to all that was said, prompting the repetition of this or that trait or adventure. And where were you at such a time, Papa? And what did you say then? And tell Mrs. Breton what happened on that occasion. Thus she drew him out. She did not again yield to any effervescence of glee. The infantine sparkle was exhaled for the night. She was soft, thoughtful, and docile. It was pretty to see her bid good night. 
Her manner to Graham was touched with dignity. In her very slight smile and quiet bow spoke the Countess, and Graham could not but look grave and bend responsive. I saw he hardly knew how to blend together in his ideas the dancing fairy and delicate dame. Next day, when we were all assembled round the breakfast-table, shivering and fresh from the morning's chill ablutions, Mrs. Breton pronounced a decree that nobody, who was not forced by dire necessity, should quit her house that day. Indeed, egress seemed next to impossible. The drift darkened the lower panes of the casement, and, on looking out, one saw the sky and air vexed and dim, the wind and snow in angry conflict. There was no fall now, but what had already descended was torn up from the earth, whirled round by brief shrieking gusts, and cast into a hundred fantastic forms. The Countess seconded Mrs. Breton. "'Papa shall not go out,' said she, placing a seat for herself beside her father's armchair. "'I will look after him. You won't go into town, will you, papa?' "'Aye, and no,' was the answer. "'If you and Mrs. Breton are very good to me, Polly, kind, you know, and attentive, if you pet me in a very nice manner, and make much of me, I may possibly be induced to wait an hour after breakfast, and see whether this razor-edged wind settles. But, you see, you give me no breakfast. You offer me nothing. You let me starve.' "'Quick, please, Mrs. Breton. "'And pour out the coffee,' entreated Paulina, "'whilst I take care of the Count de Bossompierre in other respects. "'Since he grew into a Count, he has needed so much attention.' "'She separated and prepared a roll. "'There, Papa, are your pistolets charged,' said she. "'And there is some marmalade, just the same sort of marmalade we used to have at Breton, "'and which you said was as good as if it had been conserved in Scotland.' "'And which your little ladyship used to beg for my boy. "'Do you remember that?' interposed mrs breton have you forgotten how you would come to my elbow and touch my sleeve with the whisper please ma'am something good for graham a little marmalade or honey or jam no mamma broke in dr john laughing yet reddening it surely was not so i could not have cared for these things did he or did he not paulina he liked them asserted paulina never blush for a john said mr home encouragingly I like them myself yet, and always did, and Polly showed her sense in catering for a friend's material comforts. It was I who put her into the way of such good manners, nor do I let her forget them. Uh, Polly, offer me a small slice of that tongue. There, papa. But remember you are only waited upon, with this assiduity, on condition of being persuadable, and reconciling yourself to La Terrasse for the day. Mrs. Breton, said the Count, I want to get rid of my daughter, uh, to send her to school. Do you know of any good school? There is Lucy's place, Madame Beck's. Miss Snow is in a school. I am a teacher, I said, and was rather glad of the opportunity of saying this. For a little while I had been feeling as if placed in a false position. Mrs. Breton and son knew my circumstances, but the Count and his daughter did not. They might choose to vary by some shades their hitherto cordial manner towards me, when aware of my grade in society. I spoke then readily, but a swarm of thoughts I had not anticipated nor invoked rose dim at the words, making me sigh involuntarily. Mr. Home did not lift his eyes from his breakfast-plate for about two minutes, nor did he speak. Perhaps he had not caught the words— Perhaps he thought that, on a confession of that nature, politeness would interdict comment. The Scotch are proverbially proud, and homely as was Mr. Home in look, simple in habits and tastes, I have all along intimated that he was not without his share of the national quality. Was his a pseudo-pride? Was it real dignity? I leave the question undecided in its wide sense. Where it concerned me individually, I can only answer— then and always he showed himself a true-hearted gentleman. By nature he was a feeler and a thinker. Over his emotions and his reflections spread a mellowing of melancholy, more than a mellowing. In trouble and bereavement it became a cloud. He did not know much about Lucy Snow. What he knew he did not very accurately comprehend. 
Indeed, his misconceptions of my character often made me smile, but he saw my walk in life lay rather on the shady side of the hill. He gave me credit for doing my endeavour to keep the course honestly straight. He would have helped me if he could. Having no opportunity of helping, he still wished me well. When he did look at me, his eye was kind. When he did speak, his voice was benevolent. Yours, said he, is an arduous calling. I wish you health and strength to win in it success. His fair little daughter did not take the information quite so composedly. She fixed on me a pair of eyes wide with wonder, almost with dismay. Are you a teacher? cried she. Then, having paused on the unpalatable idea, Well, I never knew what you were, nor ever thought of asking. For me you were always Lucy Snow. And what am I now? I could not forbear inquiring. Yourself, of course. But do you really teach here, in Villette? I really do. And do you like it? Not always. And why do you go on with it? Her father looked at, and I feared was going to check her. But he only said, Proceed, Polly, proceed with that catechism. Prove yourself the little wiseacre you are. If Miss Snow were to blush and look confused, I should have to bid you hold your tongue, and you and I would sit out the present meal in some disgrace. But she only smiles, so push her hard, multiply the cross questions. Well, Miss Snow, why do you go on with it? Chiefly, I fear, for the sake of the money I get. Not then from motives of pure philanthropy. Polly and I were clinging to that hypothesis as the most lenient way of accounting for your eccentricity. No, no, sir. Rather for the roof of shelter I am thus enabled to keep over my head, and for the comfort of mind it gives me to think that while I can work for myself, I am spared the pain of being a burden to anybody. Papa, say what you will. I pity Lucy. Take up that pity, Miss de Bassompierre. Take it up in both hands, as you might a little callow gosling squattering out of bounds without leave. Put it back in the warm nest of a heart whence it issued, and receive in your ear this whisper. If my Polly ever came to know by experience the uncertain nature of this world's goods, I should like her to act as Lucy acts, to work for herself, that she might burden neither kith nor kin. Yes, papa, said she, pensively and tractably. But poor Lucy, I thought she was a rich lady, and had rich friends. You thought like a little simpleton. I never thought so. When I had time to consider Lucy's manner and aspect, which wasn't often, I saw she was one who had to guard and not be guarded, to act and not be served, and this lot has, I imagine, helped her to an experience for which, if she live long enough to realize its full benefit, she may yet bless Providence. But this school, he pursued, changing his tone from grave to gay, would Madame Beck admit, my Polly, do you think, Miss Lucy? I said there needed but to try, Madame. It would soon be seen. She was fond of English pupils. If you, sir, I added, will but take Miss de Bassompierre in your carriage this very afternoon, I think I can answer for it that Rosine, the portress, will not be very slow in answering your ring, and Madame, I am sure, will put on her best pair of gloves to come into the salon to receive you. In that case, responded Mr. Home. I see no sort of necessity there is for delay. Mrs. Harris can send what she calls her young lady's things after her. Polly can settle down to her horn-book before night, and you, Miss Lucy, I trust, will not disdain to cast an occasional eye upon her, and let me know from time to time how she gets on. I hope you approve of the arrangement, Countess de Bassompierre. The Countess hemmed and hesitated. I thought, said she, I thought I had finished my education. That only proves how much we may be mistaken in our thoughts. I hold a far different opinion, as most of these will who have been auditors of your profound knowledge of life this morning. 
Ah, my little girl, thou hast much to learn, and papa ought to have taught thee more than he has done. Come, there is nothing for it but to try Madame Beck, and the weather seems settling, and I have finished my breakfast. But papa! Well? I see an obstacle. I don't, at all. It is enormous, papa. It can never be got over. It is as large as you in your greatcoat, and the snowdrift on the top. And like that snowdrift, capable of melting? No, it is of too, too solid flesh. It is just your own self. Miss Lucy, warn Madame Beck not to listen to any overtures about taking me, because in the end it would turn out that she would have to take papa too. As he is so teasing, I will just tell tales about him. Mrs. Breton and all of you listen. About five years ago, when I was twelve years old, he took it into his head that he was spoiling me, that I was growing unfitted for the world, and I don't know what, and nothing would serve or satisfy him, but I must go to school. I cried, and so on, but Monsieur de Bossompierre proved hard-hearted, quite firm and flinty, and to school I went. What was the result? In the most admirable manner, Papa came to school likewise. Every other day he called to see me. Madame Agrito grumbled, but it was of no use, and so, at last, Papa and I were both, in a manner, expelled. Lucy can just tell Madame Beck this little trait. It is only fair to let her know what she has to expect. Mrs. Breton asked Mr. Home what he had to say in answer to this statement. As he made no defence, judgment was given against him, and Paulina triumphed. But she had other moods besides the arch and naive. After breakfast, when the two elders withdrew, I suppose to talk over certain of Mrs. Breton's business matters, and the Countess, Dr. Breton, and I were for a short time alone together. All the child left her. With us, more nearly her companions in age, she rose at once to the little lady. Her very face seemed to alter. That play of feature and candour of look which, when she spoke to her father, made it quite dimpled and round, yielded to an aspect more thoughtful, and lines distincter, and less mobile. No doubt Graham noted the change as well as I. He stood for some minutes near the window, looking out at the snow. Presently he approached the hearth, and entered into conversation, but not quite with his usual ease. Fit topics did not seem to rise to his lips. He chose them fastidiously, hesitatingly, and consequently, infelicitously. He spoke vaguely of Villette, its inhabitants, its notable sites and buildings. He was answered by Mr. Bassompierre in quite womanly sort, with intelligence, with a manner not indeed wholly disindividualized. A tone, a glance, a gesture, here and there, rather animated and quick than measured and stately, still recalled little Polly. But there was so fine and even a polish, so calm and courteous a grace, gilding and sustaining these peculiarities, that a less sensitive man than Graham would not have ventured to seize upon them as vantage points, leading to franker intimacy. Yet while Dr. Breton continued subdued, and for him sedate, he was still observant. Not one of those petty impulses and natural breaks escaped him. He did not miss one characteristic movement, one hesitation in language, or one lisp in utterance. At times, in speaking fast, she still lisped, but coloured whenever such laps occurred, and, in a painstaking, conscientious manner, quite as amusing as the slight error, repeated the word more distinctly. Whenever she did this, Dr. Breton smiled. Gradually, as they conversed, the restraint on each side slackened. Might the conference have but been prolonged, I believe it would soon have become genial. Already to Paulina's lip and cheek returned the wreathing, dimpling smile. She lisped once and forgot to correct herself. And Dr. John, I know not how he changed, but change he did. He did not grow gayer. No raillery, no levity sparkled across his aspect. But his position seemed to become one of more pleasure to himself, and he spoke his augmented comfort in readier language, in tones more suave. Ten years ago this pair had always found abundance to say to each other. The intervening decade had not narrowed the experience or impoverished the intelligence of either. Besides, there are certain natures of which the mutual influence is such 
that the more they say, the more they have to say. For these, out of association, grows adhesion, and out of adhesion, amalgamation. Graham, however, must go. His was a profession whose claims are neither to be ignored nor deferred. He left the room. But before he could leave the house, there was a return. I am sure he came back, not for the paper or card in his desk, which formed his ostensible errand, but to assure himself by one more glance that Paulina's aspect was really such as memory was bearing away, that he had not been viewing her somehow by a partial, artificial light, and making a fond mistake. No, he found the impression true. Rather, indeed, he gained than lost by this return. He took away with him a parting look, shy but very soft, as beautiful, as innocent, as any little fawn could lift out of its cover of fern, or any lamb from its meadow-bed. Being left alone, Paulina and I kept silence for some time. We both took out some work, and plied a mute and diligent task. The white wood work-box of old days was now replaced by one inlaid with precious mosaic, and furnished with implements of gold. The tiny and trembling fingers that could scarce guide the needle, though tiny still, were now swift and skilful. But there was the same busy knitting of the brow, the same little dainty mannerisms, the same quick turns and movements, now to replace a stray tress, and anon to shake from the silken skirt some imaginary atom of dust, some clinging fibre of thread. That morning I was disposed for silence. The austere fury of the winter day had on me an awing, hushing influence. That passion of January, so white and so bloodless, was not yet spent. The storm had roared itself hoarse, but seemed no nearer exhaustion. Had Ginevra Farnshaw been my companion in that drawing-room, she would not have suffered me to muse and listen undisturbed. The presence just gone from us would have been her theme, and how she would have wrung the changes on one topic— how she would have pursued and pestered me with questions and surmises, worried and oppressed me with comments and confidences I did not want, and longed to avoid. Paulina Mary cast once or twice towards me a quiet but penetrating glance of her dark, full eye. Her lips half opened, as if to the impulse of coming utterance. But she saw, and delicately respected my inclination for silence. "'This will not hold long,' I thought to myself." for I was not accustomed to find in women or girls any power of self-control or strength of self-denial. As far as I knew them, the chance of a gossip about their usually trivial secrets, the often very washy and paltry feelings, was a treat not to be readily foregone. The little countess promised an exception. She sewed till she was tired of sewing, and then she took a book. As chance would have it, she had sought it in Dr. Breton's own compartment of the bookcase, and it proved to be an old Breton book, some illustrated work of natural history. Often had I seen her standing at Graham's side, resting that volume on his knee and reading to his tuition, and when the lesson was over, begging as a treat that he would tell her all about the pictures. I watched her keenly. Here was a true test of that memory she had boasted. Would her recollections now be faithful? Faithful. It could not be doubted. As she turned the leaves, over her face passed gleam after gleam of expression, the least intelligent of which was a full greeting to the past. And then she turned to the title page, and looked at the name written in the schoolboy hand. She looked at it long, nor was she satisfied with merely looking. She gently passed over the characters, the tips of her fingers, accompanying the action with an unconscious but tender smile, which converted the touch into a caress. Paulina loved the past, but the peculiarity of this little scene was that she said nothing. She could feel without pouring out her feelings in a flux of words. She now occupied herself at the bookcase for nearly an hour, taking down volume after volume and renewing her acquaintance with each. This done, she seated herself on a low stool, rested her cheek on her hand, and thought, and still was mute. The sound of the front door opened below, a rush of cold wind, and her father's voice, speaking to Mrs. Breton in the hall, startled her at last. She sprang up. She was downstairs in one second. "'Papa! Papa! You are not going out?' 
My pet, I must go into town. But it is too, too cold, papa. And then I heard Monsieur de Bassompierre showing to her how he was well provided against the weather, and how he was going to have the carriage, and to be quite snugly sheltered, and, in short, proving that she need not fear for his comfort. But you will promise to come back here this evening, before it is quite dark. You and Dr. Breton both, in the carriage. It is not fit to ride. Well, if I see the doctor, I will tell him a lady has laid on him her commands to take care of his precious health and come home early under my escort. Yes, you must say a lady, and he will think it is his mother, and be obedient. And papa, mind to come soon, for I shall watch and listen. The door closed, and the carriage rolled softly through the snow, and back returned the countess, pensive and anxious. She did listen and watch when evening closed, but it was in stillest sort, walking the drawing-room with quite noiseless step. She checked at intervals her velvet march, inclined her ear, and consulted the night sounds. I should rather say the night silence, for now at last the wind was fallen. The sky, relieved of its avalanche, lay naked and pale. Through the barren boughs of the avenue we could see it well, and note also the polar splendour of the new year moon, an orb white as a world of ice. Nor was it late when we saw also the return of the carriage. Paulina had no dance of welcome for this evening. It was with a sort of gravity that she took immediate possession of her father, as he entered the room, but she at once made him her entire property, led him to the seat of her choice, and while softly showering round him honeyed words of commendation for being so good, and coming home so soon, you would have thought it was entirely by the power of her little hand she was put into his chair, and settled and arranged. For the strong man seemed to take pleasure in wholly yielding himself to this dominion, potent only by love. Graham did not appear till some minutes after the count. Paulina half-turned when his step was heard. They spoke, but only a word or two. Their fingers met a moment, but obviously with slight contact. Paulina remained beside her father. Graham threw himself into a seat on the other side of the room. It was well that Mrs. Breton and Mr. Home had a great deal to say to each other, almost an inexhaustible fund of discourse and old recollections. Otherwise, I think, our party would have been but a still one that evening. After tea, Paulina's quick needle and pretty golden thimble were busily plied by the lamplight, but her tongue rested, and her eyes seemed reluctant to raise often their lids, so smooth and so full-fringed. Graham, too, must have been tired with his day's work. He listened dutifully to his elders and betters, said very little himself, and followed with his eye the gilded glance of Paulina's 